Welcome everyone tonight to uh, the Zoom meeting here about the National Infrastructure Bank. And our theme tonight is time to go off budget. Now the $5 trillion National Infrastructure Bank can build the US. Uh, we're not gonna take a lot of time with introductions, et cetera. We have a pretty big agenda and wanna move on. But I would ask that uh, if you have, if this is the first time you've ever been on, uh, to go to the more button and raise your hand just so we can get an idea how many people it's their first time being on, just so we get a clue uh, and we're gonna move forward. My name is Bob Lynn. I'm a retired union organizer with the Plumbers and Pipefitters. And I have been working uh, uh, with Stu and the coalition since uh, 2017, 18, something like that. Uh, we have made slow but steady progress. Uh, uh, things have actually picked up a little bit here lately and uh, it's actually looking a little promising. And one of the things that uh, I know we'll talk about today as we go on is just <clears throat> how the only way we're ever really gonna address the infrastructure uh, needs of this country is to actually uh, adopt a national infrastructure bank. It's something that we'll never accomplish through the budget. And so uh, with that being said, I'm gonna ask Alfeka Mutardi, who's uh, our economist for the coalition to kind of go through um, a brief uh, outline of where we are and how this bank works. So thank you very much. Alfeka, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Um, for those of the that, that don't know me, my name is Alfeka Mutardi and I'm a macroeconomist. Uh, and I'm with the coalition on the NIB board. So um, to start us off, I'd like to give you a little bit of update of where we are, um, especially on the economy and on the bill. Um, of course, I always track where we are in the economy and I'll send you a monthly newsletter on this, uh, but things are still not looking good. Uh, the economy is sagging quite a bit. Um, I give all these little facts and figures here on this, um, this chart, but um, uh, the one thing I would point you to is this index right here, this graph of the leading economic indicators, which puts together things like manufacturing output, housing starts, bank credit, things like that. And what you can see from this graph is that when they point, when this index points down, we have a recession that follows very shortly afterward, which is what all these gray bars are right now. And lately, over the last seven months, this index has been pointing down and down and down. Uh, so it's really underwater. Uh, look, it, according to this, uh, a recession is long overdue. And uh, we have other things to show that the, other than the tight labor market, uh, we have things to show that, for example, um, banks are in trouble with mortgages that they're holding on real estate. Um, um, the um, in inflation is still not being tamed. It's popped back up again. And then the Fed, even though it didn't change interest rates recently, it may raise them again in in December, they're already very high. Um, mortgages, 30-year mortgages are above 7%. That's killing the whole housing market. And uh, the economists are forecasting that we could go into a recession early in uh, next year. So that will be devastating for those of you that are working on going out and um, you know looking for votes for the 2024 election. If we slip into a recession and if it is accompanied by a um, banking crisis, this will be really bad news for um, whatever parties in, in power at the time. So what that, in addition to the economy turning down, we have another problem, and that is a budget crisis. And you can see the budget crisis by the fact that our national debt now exceeds $33 trillion. Uh, we added five of those trillion dollars on in the last two years, trying to dig ourselves out of the um, COVID recession. Probably overdid it, but never mind. Uh, now there is complete uh, separation of views on what we should do on the budget. The House Dem Republicans want to cut back spending. They want to cut, cut, cut spending back to 2022 levels. They're already proposing things like cutbacks to rail infrastructure, water infrastructure, those kind of things. And on top of that, this weekend, we're threatened with another yet another government shutdown and an inability to decide what we're going to do with our next budget that starts on October 1st. So we need a budget workaround. And to show you, to put even more a finer point on it, why we need a budget workaround, the last time we pay, passed an infrastructure bill, 
It got made smaller and smaller and smaller because through the budget, we couldn't decide on how to pay for it. It's not anywhere near enough. This compares that uh, extra funding from that uh, bipartisan law with what the National Infrastructure Bank will provide, which is 10 times greater amount, and it'll do it through a budget workaround. In addition, the NIB can offset any coming recession. It'll rationalize, rationalize things like our housing market, you know, our crumbling bridges and roads. Uh, it'll direct investment into the very best investments we can make in the economy to grow the economy faster, create millions of great per permanent, uh, great paying jobs. We've done this four times before in our nation's past. I'm sorry, I always forget to make my slides uh, bigger. Uh, we've done it four times in our nation's past. Uh, and uh, at, at times like this, when we had high debt, budgets that couldn't handle anything and economic deterioration. And this time would be no different. That's why we need a fifth bank. We'll cover everything that people need, like our uh, repairing our transportation systems, water systems, upgrade electric power grids so they won't burn down a whole island like they did in Maui, Hawaii, uh, build high-speed rail so that we can get people back and forth, inner city traffic and you know save on fuel and that kind of thing, broadband everywhere. Affordable house housing is in crisis right now. We as stat need those systems and large-scale water projects where we have drought and we grow our nation's food and our food supply and how food prices are likely to go up as a result of all that. In addition, we can really work on helping low-income communities, making sure that they have a fair shake at getting jobs through the infrastructure bank. Uh, small businesses are brought on board uh, to build up and develop them over time. Uh, we can uh, uh, do run, run projects in both rural and urban areas, red and blue states build out affordable housing and hook it up to transportation systems. And we, out of all of this, we can have equitable economic growth and improvement in our economy. So I'll stop there and see, uh, see if any, anybody has any questions in the question and answer period. Thanks. Yes, uh, we have a uh, uh, congressman from Pennsylvania is going to uh, uh, greet us today. Go ahead uh, with the video, Mark. Hello, I'm Congressman Dwight Evans, proudly representing Pennsylvania's third congressional district. It is extremely important in the subject that I'm talking about is national infrastructure. I want to particularly thank my colleague Danny Davis from Illinois, who's been a part of this effort, along with the coalition and all of you in terms of what you have done. It is important to understand that the significant role that you play, it is important because we're talking about building jobs for the future. Our infrastructure is something that we desperately need. Because of you and your effort working in conjunction with us, we can make a difference for all the people, not just in Philadelphia, but across the nation. So I'm glad today to just thank you and encourage your involvement. We must keep building. Thank you very much. fantastic to have uh, uh, the congressman address us to be able to do that. One of the people who is uh, working very strongly towards uh, helping us get the national infrastructure moving forward. We're going to move on to Dr. Nami Prince, uh, and, and uh, she's going to move forward here to be able to talk to us a little bit about her uh, expertise. Uh, she's the author of Permanent Distortion and a former Wall Street uh, executive, and she's from Los Angeles, California. So the floor is yours, Nami. Um, thank you so much, um, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, again, it's it's great to to be here again, and also to see the faces that have been here for so long and working on this for so long, and all the new ones as well. Um, I want to, as always, underscore things that Alfeca has said because um, she she just says things um, so eloquently and has put so much in fantastic information behind, um, as always. And there's a couple things to underscore um, that I want to build upon, and that has to do with um, our country's debt. Our lack of ability on a regular basis to agree upon a budget, um, when I say our, I mean the United States government for the various reasons that we're seeing unfolding um, again as we speak, um, and the fact that in order to build long-term lasting infrastructure, we need long-term lasting financing mechanisms. And at the end of the day, 
um, what, what the NIB provides, um, what we are doing is providing not simply a bank, it is a bank, but also the ability to create a funding mechanism that's not going to stop every single time there's a budget squabble and every single time there's drama on the Hill. But the idea is that it circumvents all of that by, you know, as like I said, sort of a workaround budget so that we can actually um, have financing. I came from a Wall Street background into, um, into writing, into being a journalist, into working working on all these issues on behalf of, of the people of this country. And the reality is that this particular bank, this way of financing long-term development, long-term necessary infrastructure is very much a page out of Wall Street's book, but it's a page where we can actually use it to our collective advantage. And it's basically leveraging or taking um, a seed amount of money and multiplying it effectively by 10 times by using that seed. So taking say a half a trillion dollars worth of treasury bonds, repurposing them, taking them out of the $33 trillion of debt that we have outstanding on the books of this country, taking part of them out of the $5 trillion worth of treasury bonds that is sitting on the books of the Federal Reserve doing nothing, and saying to the private community, investors, banks, et cetera, even potentially the Fed, this is a better way to utilize that collateral to utilize that seed money that already exists in the form of debt, not to buy else, but to literally reduce our borrowing. Right now, today in our country, we are spending almost one percent of our GDP, which, as Alfeco noted, is not really our, our economy is kind of on you know, in a shaky ground right now. But it, it's been for a long time. We, on average, have barely, barely been able to make two percent per year every year for the last two decades. Barely. We're hovering around zero at the best of times. And we only had economic spikes in GDP after we had declines in GDP due to COVID in the last couple of decades. Um, and we had declines in the wake of the financial crisis. And then we had some up upticks after that. But the reality is we're hovering around zero. We're not growing. And in order to grow, we need to invest. In order to invest, we need a, a solid form of capital that continues on through long-term investment so that jobs can be created, so that infrastructure can be bettered, and so that we compete, compete not just for our future, um, but also relative to other countries that are using some of their debt or issuing money or issuing bonds to be able to do the same thing. So that's the one thing I remember doing on Wall Street back in the day was taking um, long-term investors into long-term projects, basically matching the investment with the length of the project. And that's what we want to do here. And banks aren't doing that. And I want to underscore this is very, very important. Wall Street banks do not like to do what doesn't make them money. And they really don't like to do long-term things. They don't have to. We have a banking structure, which is a whole other entire conversation, where the largest banks that actually could capitalize long-term projects specifically don't because they're not required to. They are too big to fail. They have been made bigger since the financial crisis. And you're not going to get JP Morgan Chase to care about a water project in the middle of Colorado or anything else on a long-term basis. Basis. They have a, a very different MO. So we can take how they finance and use that in the bank, but we can recognize that they don't. And then the, the final problem that we have is that regional banks, the banks that potentially could work on some of this and could be long term, are failing. There are 732 banks in this country that are on the Fed's watch list for potential failure. We have seen bankruptcies. We've seen delinquencies and loans increase. We have seen what's going on right now, which is car loans, home loans, credit cards. People are more and more in debt than they have ever been at historic levels and currently at very high interest rate payments. That situation is not going to get better. The more debt we have, the more expensive it is to serve it, the more, the more of our GDP that goes to servicing that debt, the less those people actually have to grow their jobs, their communities, and their own finances, and the more that when they do come to be unable to pay for their mortgages, their car loans, their high credit card debt at the same time, they sink further and further beyond um, what our economy should be providing them. And so this is a way to say, look, we're, we're, we're at a moment right now that's more critical than it was when the NIB was first envisioned to get it passed. And it should be more critical for every single congressperson on both sides of the aisle, because right now we have the highest debt that we have had as a nation ever. We've got the highest individual debt that we've had ever. Our economy is stagnating and our banks are failing. So if that's not a series of good reasons to say, you know, what's the way out? The way out is to fund infrastructure. The way out is to fund our future. The way out is to fund development. And this is a financial mechanism to get that done. Um, there really is no better time. Um, and so this is one of the things right now, walking into any congressperson's office um, should be front and center, whatever their issue is, whatever their state needs, whatever they personally are horse trading behind the scenes. This is the moment where it makes 
perfect economic and financial sense to get behind um, this bill and for us to push all of these reasons that are negatives for our economy, but positives for what we can build in our future on an infrastructure with an infrastructure bank with this particular financing mechanism behind it. Thank you very much for that, Nami. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to move on to uh, Senator Liz Lovely. Hi Washington. there, everybody. Go ahead. Oh, no. Hey, did you have something else? <laughs> nope. I was just going to say who you <laughs> that you were from the Washington uh, state of Washington in the Senate. And uh, I was going to turn the floor over to you. All right. Well, uh, nice to see some familiar faces. I, I saw a uh, volunteer extraordinaire, Carol Sullivan, on this call. So nice to see your face there for a minute. Uh, so I'm Liz Lovelett. I live in Anacortes, Washington, and I represent uh, western portions of some big agricultural areas and a major university, as well as a gorgeous island archipelago, the San Juan Islands, where we're balancing the last of the whales with um, heavy oil refining. So a lot of different uh, and complex infrastructure needs in our area. And the reason I'm here today and continue to support the, the concept of the National Infrastructure Bank is that infrastructure is the underpinning of our basic quality of life. I started out as a city council member and wrestled with huge changes to our water utility, to our sewer utility, to how we manage stormwater. And at the end of the day, there just are never enough dollars to go around to get all these projects done. Uh, now that I've moved on to serving in the legislature, and I've been uh, one of the, the principal proponents of our own state bank initiative, but additionally helped out with the joint memorial to uh, make sure that we are impressing on our Congress people that we are interested in a national solution as well is that I've watched a few budget uh, cycles in my tenure now. And what I can say is that those appropriations that we make, you know, often labeled as pork projects that we need to take home are really just the meat and potatoes that are our, our quality of life. So when we think about that pothole in front of our road, that's as local as politics get. People wanna make sure that they can get to and from work, that when they turn the, the faucet on in their house, that water comes out of it. And when we do our unmentionables and we flush the toilet, that it has somewhere to go. Uh, and those projects are forever projects, right? Like once you fill that pothole, once you make sure you replace that sewer line, uh, it, guess what? 20 years from now, 50 years from now, you're going to need to replace it again. So the reason why I love the National Infrastructure Bank is it's basically the gift that keeps on giving, right? We're never going to run out of infrastructure projects. We're never going to run out of needs. At the end of the day, as soon as we finish our big, long laundry list of things we need to get done, we have to start all over again and, and do it again. Um, I also chair the Ferry Legislator Caucus for uh, my state we have the second largest um, uh, ferry system in the, in the world. And one of the things that has been really challenging is we didn't pay for boats. Uh, we got one boat delivered in about 20 years. And guess what? We need one every other year, not just for five years or 10 years, in perpetuity. Uh, these are the infrastructure obligations that we have if we're going to provide basic needs and, and services for folks. And then the other reason why I'm really keenly invested in this endeavor is because the reason why I'm involved in politics at all is climate change. Uh, you know, as a very young kid, I learned about the hole in the ozone layer and the impacts that corporations were having on our uh, atmosphere, on the land, on indigenous people in places around the world. And infrastructure is our way to answer the call of climate change. Uh, it is the way that we make sure that we have water available to places uh, across the United States that is drinkable, that is clean, that has pipes that have been replaced when we know there's problems. It's, you know, septic and sewer, not a sexy subject, but guess what? When that starts leaking into the water table, now you're having issues with your drinking water quality. You're having issues with species and microorganisms being able to survive. Uh, transit is another perfect example. You know, here we are in a place in, in, in the Western United States in particular, uh, we didn't bother to get subways and light rail and all of that good stuff. And we're going back trying to pinch hit it now. And what you have is an entire coast of people that ultimately is reliant on their cars because the transit options are not as ubiquitous as we would like to get us from here to there. All of those things contribute to a lowering of our carbon intensity. It makes for livable, walkable communities, and it makes sure that we are putting skin in the game on ensuring our long and enduring climate resilience and that we're making sure that our infrastructure can weather the storms of sea level rise. It, in my area, one of the biggest um, potential impacts to our water and sewer system is the fact that they might be underwater at a certain point. And what are we doing to be ahead of those changes? 
is. Uh, you know, these are the, the very real concerns that municipal governments, state governments, and the federal government are dealing with. But the reality is there's just not enough money to go around. And I really want to underscore what Nomi said around the appropriation process. Uh, now that I've been on the Transportation Committee for several years now in the legislature, I can tell you we can't possibly fund everything. And it's always this tension between, you know, what is, you know, what intersection has had the most fatalities and so therefore we need to improve it. Well, that is an imp incredibly important metric. But what about all of the other intersections that have in in intense traffic impacts or that make it so that a pedestrian can't get from one side of town to the other. These are equally important. And, and that doesn't even begin to touch on the ableism that is inherent in our infrastructure, you know, making sure that folks with disabilities can walk from one or, or mo be mobile from one part of town to another is incredibly important and meaningful for, for folks in their, their everyday lives. We have seniors trying to age in place. There's just so many reasons why the enduring characteristics of our infrastructure are important for, for underpinning that quality of life from community to community. And that need is ubiquitous across the entire United States. And so with the National Infrastructure Bank, we can really get to work making sure that our highways are intact, that we have high-speed rail across this country, that they have the skin to put in the game in the local communities to make sure that they have clean drinking water, regardless of socioeconomic and class considerations. Because I tell you what, at the end of the day, the people who are bearing the brunt of our indecision around making infrastructure investments are Black and Brown people across the United States and communities who have already had their neighbors neighborhoods bisected by highways, where we have put the polluting factories, and it is time to put first dollars in in some of these areas where people have long felt left behind by government processes. So happy to be here with you guys today. I'm happy to take any follow-up questions and looking forward to the road ahead so we can get some really meaningful investments in our communities in the near distant future. Thank you very much for that, Senator. Uh, great presentation. Uh, our next uh, Person up is Representative Arthur Handy from uh, Rhode Island, uh, House of Representatives. So the floor is yours, Representative yeah, so, Arthur uh, Handy. It's not fair I have to go after Senator Lovelet there. Uh, she just really uh, uh, stole seventy-five percent of my thunder, probably. But um, but uh, I think she did a great, and actually everybody else obviously doing a great job at, at really explaining the need for something like this. I I. Um, um, I, I also appreciate that that um, she and I, I think both also come from it. We have to look at it as a really positive uh, and not spend as much time, unfortunately, talking about the dark, dark parts of things that we got set up with, uh, which is obviously a piece of this, too. We need to have you need to have that side of it. But uh, I also look at it. Um, I've, I've been in the legislature a long time, 21 years. And um, uh, over that time, I've seen this fight to try to do things around schools because you know, Rhode Island is one of the first 13 colonies, right? So we're one of the oldest states in the country. And so our infrastructure is obviously one of the oldest uh, in the country. Well, not necessarily, I suppose, but it is <laughs> among the oldest in the country. Uh, Providence Water that, that provides water for about 60% of the state is 100 years old. A lot of that infrastructure is older because obviously they took over um, a lot of pieces of that. But uh, one of the things I remember fighting for a number of years ago, because I got, I, I, I kept on feeling like I was the harbinger of doom whenever I would talk about climate change back in the, uh, not, not the old days, I suppose, but but a while back when it was a little bit harder to get people to listen, um, I started bending a little bit toward trying to blend uh, mitigation and resilience together. And actually, I think a lot of the projects that, um, that, that Senator Lovelet talked about and that I talk about and we talk about really create opportunities to both be mitigating of climate and carbon and resilient to it. Um, uh, one of the ways I learned to try to talk about climate change was to, because I'm sort of a data person, I'm kind of a nerd about data stuff, and I love numbers, was to instead really try to switch toward more anecdotal ways and, and uh, coming up with stories. And so I, I, I remember going to uh, hearing a doctor uh, who um, was down in New Orleans in, in, um, during Katrina, and um, it, it, it prompted me to realize that there but um, even our state like Rhode Island has the same kind of situation. You get um, a, 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 just as a useful story to tell people was, I'm like, you know, think about a nursing home where your aunt or your grandmother is. Think about we get a hurricane that knocks out our power for seven days and it, over, it overlaps with uh, a heat wave of, say, 90 plus degrees for during that window. 
people in that nursing home are going to to die. And that's part of what I am now going to the dark place here, I guess. But my, my point is that the resilience that we can build into that. So then, you know, so we can also use something like the infrastructure bank to, to fund um, a, a mix of sort of green solutions to those problems. That might be a mix of um, uh, uh, flood management. So we're instead of, you know, we're using green water infrastructure instead of gray water infrastructure. Um, we're using it for, uh, and, and one of the reasons why I feel like the infrastructure bank can be more helpful for that is, well, first of all, Rhode Island has, we have a Rhode Island infrastructure, infrastructure bank that's been helping, but it's just not capitalized in a way that really we can make things happen. So I, I, I think something like this is important for that, but, um, but green water infrastructure opportunities there Will, will help us with flood management. Will help us with um, uh, maintenance of that 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 uh, um, those types of things. But also, obviously, doing a lot potentially for for carbon mitigation as well. Um, you know, it might be green roofs. It might be a lot of things like that. And when, when I Rhode Island actually is, is one of the worst in the country. I think we were like ranked forty third or forty eighth. I can't remember the number now. Um, just back in May for our infrastructure here in Rhode Island. So we are sorely in need of resolution and that's even with decades the whole time i've been in we've always been talking about how are we going to address this and uh i, I really think fundamentally something like this at least gives us and our community the communities so not just the state but obviously the communities um opportunities here because i i i've had to fight tooth and nail sometimes just to get technical support for cities and towns you know we have relatively small cities and towns we're a small state so we have small cities and towns just to have the resources to know what to do when they're doing their infrastructure stuff. But it's like having a cancer screening without any cancer treatment, right? You got to have both. And fundamentally, we need to have some resources for our cities and towns to be able to respond. Um, I'm really, I, again, I feel like everybody already has, has covered a lot of things I would talk about, but um, I do think that there's a lot of places where when they're, um, where there's newer communities that are going to need support. You know, there's also all the communities up and down, say the Colorado River that are, are looking at just drastic, especially the southern end of it, uh, drastic water um, issues. But there's also a lot of places that um, uh, both the communities at the certain level it was talking about in terms of, of communities of color and low income communities, but but even just, uh, just the broad array of just the, the backbone of our, our state's uh, economies, which is unfortunately, our case a lot of times is roads as opposed to rails i'd like it to be more rails than roads but um but those bridges all those places we're talking about the economy is not going to survive let alone thrive without us um stepping into the slot hard and i think that that's what i, I think is exciting about the Nat national infrastructure Bank. so i'll leave it with that because all i can do is just keep going with the same kind of stuff. <laughs> well <laughs> i appreciate uh, your comments there uh, from Rhode Island, as you can see, from Rhode Island to Washington, uh, yeah. uh, same issues as it goes on to be able to do it. There's, yeah, coast and, to coast. And, yep, coast to coast in order to do it. And with that, uh, we're going to move on. Why don't we go to uh, Michael Flynn, who is the Senior Director of Cushman and Wakefield Rail Advisory Group. The floor is yours, Michael. So I'm Michael Flynn. I'd like to thank everyone for the privilege of being able to speak this evening. I head up the rail advisory group at Cushman and Wakefield. Um, what we do is the team that I work on at Cushman and Wakefield, we focus specifically on helping our clients with rail served real estate transactions across the United States uh, with a specific focus on freight rail. Um, the type of assets we typically work on is basically what you see behind me. Um, large scale terminals, transload facilities. Um, we also do a lot of work. We do even more things associated with agriculture, uh, distribution of fertilizer, um, locations where farmers can, you know, basically bring in their materials um, and then have them distributed throughout the United States and even like internationally. The reason that I was asked to, to speak is um, we basically work across the United States on projects where we we basically are seeing a very, very strong need for this bank. Um, the majority of the intermodal network that we have throughout the United States is largely built out. We don't need any more intermodal. 
system, right? Intermodal, by and large, makes up about 50, 52% of the, the goods that are shipped on rail throughout the United States. What we really need as a nation right now are a series of high volume, multi-commodity transload facilities like the one behind me um, in not only every state, but in some states, multiple. And the reason that we need this as a nation is there's intermodal traffic. And then there's also, you know, there's unit train volume, which is 100 railroad cars. And then there's manifest freight, which is less than 100 railroad cars. Now, the railroads are happy to ship whatever they're required to, right? But one of the things that we're struggling with as a nation is we are so heavily truck dependent that we've got this massive carbon footprint. We spend a fortune, an untold fortune on our road systems every year, and we're really not getting the type of return that we should. So, Mike, why are you saying all this? Where are you going? Um, if there was a way for public private entities, right? You may have a single landowner who is basically working in partnership with a you know, public entity, be an economic development group. Um, it could be a port authority and it doesn't have to be a port authority on water. It could be inland, right? Form a partnership and basically start going forward with plans to build things like this. And what it does allows states to do is to move volumes of goods in and out of that state, specifically around manifest freight. You can also move intermodal, but again, the network's built out for that. What it will allow us to do as a nation is dramatically cut down on our carbon footprint and help where I think the, the trucking industry really needs some help which is we still have too many long haul truckers. You're not gonna take jobs away from those truckers and you're not gonna take them away from those union members. What you're gonna allow them to do with facilities like this is where one railroad car is equal to anywhere from between two and a half to four and a half tractor trailers worth of that same volume, right? Depends on the commodity. In a nutshell, what winds up happening is you can ship that material from let's say Savannah to Missouri on rail, where right now they may be taking it off of an ocean carrier, placing that same container onto a truck and they're driving it, ship more on rail. And when you have facilities like these that can receive them, what happens is the rail cars, the trains pull in, they have to unload the rail cars. So like right over here in this facility, that white box right there, it's about, I don't know, 1.5, 1.8 million feet you know, one mile line. They literally come in with forklifts and whatever other trans load materials or excuse me, equipment they need to. They take this material off of these rail cars. They get it into warehouses. They put it directly on trucks or it can be stored on the ground. Again, Mike, where are you going with all this? Instead of us, like in this, what I see is this draconian method of continuously trucking way too much of our goods, put more on rail, but you have to have receptor sites throughout the United States where you can literally go in and develop these facilities. The bank that's being discussed right now and proposed, this would be like, I think one of the most wonderful ways to leverage that bank and one of probably the most practical. And it is, you can get both sides of the aisle and it doesn't matter where you are in the United States Everybody, when you sit down and you look at what, like the power behind these facilities of what it does to a local economy, to a county economy, to a regional economy, a state, and then a multi-state regional economy, it's off the chain. Because what's happening is we have so many goods and services that we're capable of producing and providing in this country that because we're trucking, it's crushing um, profitability. You put it on a train, and basically what happens by default, the standard basically industry metric is um, if you ship, again, one rail car, wherever it is, it gets four, four and a half tractor trailers, you're going to save 20% in your shipping cost. And your carbon footprint is going to be dramatically reduced. Well, now you're talking about a situation where these facilities inherently reduce cost for whoever is basically shipping their goods in and out of 
It makes us as a nation more profitable. It makes the communities that have businesses around these facilities able to be more stable because they can get their raw materials in cheaper. They can push their finished goods in cheaper. And it, it truly does help to solidify the, I'm going to say, micro and macro economy nationally that we really, really need. And I'll just say, because I'm sure I'm probably out of time and I'm sorry for rambling. If anybody wants to see um, further demonstrations of any of this, we've got mapping software that allows us to see almost every single piece of rail serve real estate in the United States, overlays for federal railroads, um, transmission level power, substations, wetlands and whatnot. So we can literally sit there and say like, okay, in Rhode Island, you're saying you're having a tough time. Well, it's like, put it here, wherever here is, and you can sit there and you can see it. You know, out in Washington, it's like it's like the sea out there. You could do so much good with this. You can do it in Texas and Florida, everywhere. And by doing that, we literally, instead of rocking everything all over heck and creation, we would dramatically bring down our carbon footprint. We would dramatically increase stable local economies. And it would significantly increase our manufacturing output as a nation, creating more sustainable long-term jobs so and this is what i work on every day so it's the practical application of what you folks are so genuinely trying to do well thanks uh very much for that uh michael uh it's uh it's an important thing for us to consider to be able to rethink how we do business as it is uh we have got, gotten trapped in uh, doing things the same way. And you know what they say when you do things the same way over and over and over, that's the definition of insanity. And we need to figure out how to be able to get out of this paper bag we're in and be able to figure out how to be able to make this country start to move forward again and uh, face all the, uh, all the issues that we have out there. And uh, carbon footprint, and, and being able to address uh, the climate and everything else is something that's very real and we're gonna have to figure out how to be able to make that work. And so I think this is a very good idea. We need to keep on hammering on it. And, and I think we all agree that's on this phone call that uh, the National Infrastructure Bank gives us the opportunity to be able to have that stable financing to be able to do projects like this and to be able to start to, to move forward on that. So thank you very much. We're gonna move on to represent or to uh, Mary Jane Shimsky from New York. So Mary Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I don't know if you can see me. My phone's been acting weird tonight. But New York is a very important linchpin in all of this because we have one of the largest per capita needs in the country because our infrastructure is among the oldest infrastructure in the country. Um, recently, there have been uh, ratings which have shown our road and bridge overall condition is something like 49th out of 50 states. Um, our sewer system is a real problem and it's falling apart. And even if it weren't, it needs to be upsized to deal with the increased storms we're getting as a result of climate change. And by the way, while we're talking about climate change, there are so many new and better ways of doing things that we should be doing, whether it's new technologies to reduce our carbon footprint, whether it's more rail and less trucks, whether it's um, information technology that will help share information more effectively than some of the other methods we're using. There's just so much that needs to be done. Um, I've been working on this issue at the county level and then on the state level for a number of years. I was always a little concerned about New York because I think you all know New York is the home of the banking system in our country. And I was always worried about what effect that was going to have. And I will tell you that whenever members of the state legislature and even now members of Congress hear about this and consider what it can do for our state to help us rebuild and using the president's term, build back better. It's hard to argue with the merits of this. This is something that not only the country needs, but it's especially important for New York 
and it's gratifying to see. We did a sign around letter in the state assembly this past spring. Um, we got over 60 members of the Democratic Conference in the New York State Assembly to sign on to the letter. Um, members of Congress are having more and more meetings with the NIB coalition. I'm sure they're hearing it. And I we know that they're hearing it from their assembly members who are talking to them and saying, you know, if we want to solve our housing affordability crisis, if we want to improve um, our response to environmental catastrophe, anything you can, do you want your roads and bridges to work better? This is something we need. And I'm sure someone's already made this point, but I'll make it quickly and shut up, is when we're talking about these government shutdowns, you need to find a way to do things. First of all, we needed more money than the appropriations process, especially in the current political climate would ever get us. But even more important than that now, we need a way to make sure the country continues working, even when some of its political institutions refuse to work. And that is another genius of this whole idea. So I, it's great to hear the people who I'd never heard before talk about this, where the coalition is growing by leaps and bounds. And I know that as we keep working, other states are going to be as enthusiastic as New York is coming is becoming. And I can't wait till we finally succeed. Thank you very much for that, Mary Jane. George is a uh, representative from uh, Kentucky. So, George, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I can't see anybody or anything, but uh, I, I did talk to Stuart a couple of weeks ago in Indianapolis about the uh, infrastructure job bank and um, uh, or the uh, yeah infrastructure bank. And uh, I think it's very important. It goes back to what happened in the Eisenhower administration and rebuilding the infrastructure in America and um, lacking the, the funds and the budgetary uh, authorization, I think it's necessary to have this bank so that we can start to truly uh, affect the infrastructure in, uh, in our country. Kentucky recently had a huge tornado in Western Kentucky that wiped out almost everything. And the, uh, then last year we had flooding in Eastern Kentucky. So we were badly in need of infrastructure having uh, sewers and, and roads and, and, that, and, and bridges that would help us uh, really reinforce the infrastructure across our state. All right. Thank you very much, George, for uh, your comments on there. Uh, we seem to have a little bit of a difficulty uh, uh, with your connection. It's in and out, uh, but we do appreciate that. And uh, Kentucky, I know, has many of the same problems and issues that the rest of the states have. And it's it's good to know that we have somebody down there who's trying to uh, fight to be able to make that happen. So thank you very much for that. We're going to move on now to uh, Robert Williams from South Carolina. It looks like his mic's on, and I imagine that he can turn his video on, too. So the floor is your Robert. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. Well, look like a lot has already been said, and I uh, just wanted to echo some of the things that hasn't been said. But uh, I'm I'm very interested in this infrastructure uh, piece where uh, across the nation, but especially here in South Carolina. Um, certainly, I ser serve in the General Assembly in South Carolina, and and there's uh, many infrastructure issues that we're we're facing now. Um, and certainly we're, we're, we're trying to get on top of that in terms of, uh, building our infrastructure here across the board. We've been having a lot of, um, rainfall here and, and, and which create a lot of, a lot of, um, issues here in South Carolina for us, which create, uh, dams that has been, um, broken up in which, um, our, our state is looking at repairing some of these dams. These dams have been in places for a long time, and they provide a very critical services to a lot of the farm areas here in South Carolina. And with the with the extreme waterfall that we've been having here, 
it, it creates a lot of a lot of uneasiness and and certainly which tear up the roads and which cause people to have to take another route to their destination. Um, and some and some people get very angry about that. So I, I'm I'm all for infrastructure. I think it's critical. I think we need to uh, uh, create this particular infrastructure bank so that um, all the states around the country can be able to um, uh, use these funds to 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 calm a lot of the madness that are going on in terms of infrastructure in these states uh, like South Carolina. Um, we just been struggling, but we're we're trying to fix piecemeal these projects, in which you know by the time you fix one project, there's another leak down the road, which creates another problem for other folks. So, so it's critical, and uh, I just wanna I just wanted to say whatever we can do or I can do to help facilitate that 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 um, that piece. I'm here to do so. So. So basically, I, you know, I echo all the remarks that has been said as it relates to infrastructure, and I think it's uh, something that we really need to push hard for, especially during these times. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Uh, glad Thank we had you. South Carolina in the house. Uh, Thank you so next, much. Yep. Next, we're going to have Dr. Andrew Winnick, who's a professor of economics and statistics, retired from Cal State University in Los Angeles. So. Uh, Dr. Winnick, the floor is yours. If you'd unmute, please. Yep. Well, thank you. I, I think we all understand the critical need for infra infrastructure. So let me take a slightly different tack in terms of what I want to focus on. When I get my students coming into a class, one of the comments I'll often make to them is they may not realize it, but they have been exposed to an ideology that's not true. And one part of that ideology is the statement that no matter how bad it is in the United States, it's worse every place else. That's simply not true. You can get high-speed rail from Lisbon, Spain, Portugal to Prague, Czechoslovakia. You can get high-speed rail from Naples, Italy to Edinburgh. You can get high-speed rail all over Japan, all over South Korea, all over China. We can't build a we can't seem to build a high speed rail from San Francisco to Los Angeles, and we've been trying for ten years. Something's going on. We've got almost fifty thousand people living homeless in Los Angeles. That's a failed society. Fifty thousand people living without homes in one city. You drive in downtown L.A. and you see almost as many tents as you see houses. This is not. This is a failure. This is a country that is failing. The income gap between the leaders of our, our corporate structure and our average workers used to be 20 to one. It is now 340 to one. The, the, in, the gap between the cost of housing and the income is the worst that it's ever been. We, we have a serious, serious problem and it is structural, it's not minor. And it's not just a matter of a dysfunctional federal government who can't even seem to keep the government open. You know. It, it, it's much bro it's much broader than that. So the point I want to make is that this is a possibility, and it's been tried before. Germany has 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 the infrastructure banks. China has three infrastructure banks. South Korea has an infrastructure bank. This is a model that's been tried all over the world, and it works. We're we're not inventing something new. We've done it four times. This is how we built the Hoover Dam. This is how we built. This is th th with the under under Roosevelt. You know, this is how we built. This is how we built the Tennessee Valley Authority. We know how to do this. We just we let those those banks disappear through sunset clauses, which we will try not to have happen this time. And the point is, this can all happen off budget. This is not something that requires us to increase the federal de deficit, raise taxes. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to take this thirty three trillion dollars in U.S. government bonds that are sitting there largely unused simply as collateral for, for banks and other companies and recycle that money back into the economy and create 25 million high-income jobs. The, the bill is written in such a way that it demands that these, these be you know high-income, high-salary jobs. We can create those jobs so that we can build. You know, we've, we've seen this before. When World War II ended, we had millions of GIs coming back. They had left homes when they lived with their parents to go to war. They came back. They had no intention of living with mommy. 
They wanted to get married and have kids. We had to build housing. We did. We built 20 million homes. We know how to do this. This is not this is not new. We can we've done it before. We can do it again. The point is, do we have the political will to get this to happen? And by the way, this is not a partisan issue. You know, as someone mentioned, the you know the interstate highway system, which in part was started with the remnants of the of the end of the uh, uh, refinance corporation, and and some ta and some ta as well, but, but but both, you know, was it was uh, done under Eisenhower, a Republican administration. It used to be that that both Republicans and Democrats understood that without good infrastructure, you had no workable economy. It wasn't a par partisan issue. Now, for the moment, everything's a partisan issue here in the country. It's immobilizing us. But if we can at least get this bank created, we have a way of funding this and getting and getting the, 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 these uh, these things done. It you know it, it basically is a question of do we have the political will to, to create this? And uh, you know when I when I you know I think the point that Michael was making about trains and what have you, you know, that's all well and good, but none of those trains are running on diesel. You know, those trains have to be running on electric. They, the entire system has to re, be rebuilt for electric service, not for diesel service. You know, it's, it's nice to, it, they use less, less, you know, carbon than the trucks do, but that's not the solution. We have to build a high speed, that high speed rail system I'm talking about in the rest of the world is all electric, every single mile of it. It's not diesel. And so, you know, we, we have a major, major problem and it's, it's solvable. We know how to solve it. It's been solved. It's being solved in other countries. The question is, do we have the political will to create this bank and get it going again? I'll stop with that. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask uh, Na <clears throat> Nami Prince to come back on one more time. She has to leave us. And if she's got some uh, final thoughts she wants to leave with us, and then I'm going to open the floor to uh, to questions. So, Nami. Thank you for that. Um, I, I wanted to underscore Eisenhower for a second because, um, you know, Andrew brought it up, Michael brought it up, into, or the, the um, congressperson from Kentucky brought up this, this idea that um, we, we have the ability to, to fund infrastructure. And when we have funded infrastructure in the past, we have grown our economy and we've grown it on a bipartisan basis. And, and absolutely, the political will is not there. And so we really have it upon ourselves. We can see that in terms of what's going on right now in Washington. But 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 we are it's incumbent, I think, on all of us. And that includes it's, it's so awesome to see so many people um, representing their their local um, communities, their states. We have so many more states um, that continue to join these calls and support this cause. Um, and it'd be awesome if every single person from each of those states reached over in the aisles on their states, or at least on their uh, community, local state levels and said, you know, you're my Republican friend and it shouldn't be bipartisan. I'm saying this merely because that's the situation we're in right now, which is that our sponsors for this bill, our co-sponsors for this bill happen to all be Democrats. There's absolutely no economic, financial growth infrastructure legacy united states reason for that to be the case but it is and we are where we are so it's like you got to like divide and conquer um and i think it comes down to for a lot of these um these people the argument about money um not that that necessarily holds a lot of weight they're arguing about money right now with the budget but the point being that the arguments can stop and our infrastructure can grow and it's done that over Republican administrations, Democrat administrations, post-war. And when Eisenhower came back from war in World War II and said, we need to build a United States highway system in order to connect the country, he didn't do that merely um, merely as just a policy to have under him. He did it because of national security, because of economic growth, competitiveness, jobs, and moving the country forward. Um, and, and Democrats, Republicans alike came on board in order to do that, in order to finance, in order to vote through bills and acts and create public and private partnerships to do that, as happened in FDR's time and so forth. So we're at a time right now where we actually have to convince these people like we we I, we we make sense. <laughs> we make economic sense. We make financial sense. We're trying to create a long term financing mechanism in the National Infrastructure Bank. And we need to basically take that apart on the state level, the federal level and say, look. This is about money. Whatever your issue is, whether it is water or, or rail or roads or national security, it's it ultimately comes down to the fact that we just need a financial mechanism to do that. Right now, our financial mechanism is to issue debt and not have it appropriated or used for the growth of our economy, but to merely accumulate. 
And all we want to do is stop the accumulation of unnecessary debt by repositioning it to be used specifically for strengthening our country, making it more resilient and going back in time to go forward in time in terms of the tenants of what we can do financially to do that. So um, again, I think it comes down to money. We're creating a bank to operate like a bank for the country. That's why it's a national infrastructure bank. Um, and, and that's really the tack that, that we need to continue to drive home to um, people on all sides of the aisle, right? both sides of the aisle. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, it, it, it really comes down to uh, right now, Keep people keep talking about how we have to cut and cut deficits and all the cut spending and all the other things. And at the end of the day, we will never be able to cut enough money to be able to affect the deficits at the end of the day. We have to actually grow our economy to have a chance to be able to pay off our debts, to be able to do that. And the only way we can do that is by investing in the infrastructures that, so that we can start building so that we can be able to, to really compete and be able to get back in the game, in my opinion. Uh, and that's what we have to start to be able to do. So thank you very much right. for that. Uh, yeah, thanks Bob, for being with us. You? Thank you. Good night. Go ahead. Who who was yeah, Bob? Can I just add one real real quick thing on that note? Absolutely. We, Go for it. When we came out of World War II, the, the national debt of the United States was about a hundred percent, about one hundred two percent of GDP. A couple decades later, it was twelve percent of GDP. How much of the debt did we pay off? None. Not one penny. We didn't pay off the debt. We grew the economy. So the debt that we had became a smaller and smaller percentage of a growing economy. We can do that again. This isn't a matter of paying off the debt. It's a matter of growing the economy. And we have the capacity to do that. And if we don't grow the economy, it's not going to happen. And you cannot grow the economy without an infrastructure, without a high-speed rail system, without housing for our people, without a water system so we're not poisoning our children with lead, without all of these things. And we all know the whole list. You know, we, we could lose our ability to grow food in the Southwest if we don't move water into, into the Southwest. We can starve ourselves. We're not going to grow the economy that way. Either we build infrastructure or we become a third world country. It's it's really that simple. There are, there are no alternatives. And we're not going to build it through, through de more deficit financing. There, this is really the only viable method. So, you know, it, it's it's quite frankly, not rocket science. And it's amazing to me that we haven't been more successful in convincing the Republicans of this. It's a, it is a s sad statement about ideology, but hopefully we can get them on board. But if not, we'll have to do it with the, Demo with the Democrats alone.